Welcome to The Determinants of Health. This is Dr. Ray Watt Dionandon, and this is your first lecture. Let's begin, shall we? So let's start with a, a scenario. Let's pretend that you are a physician in the African country of Chad, which is a very poor country, and you're treating a little girl who's come in with recurring malaria. Um, you probably don't know, but malaria comes in a variety of flavors. One of them is called Vivax, and Vivax uh, is recurring. You can be cured of it, and you come back, and you get it again, and so forth. All right? So you can treat this girl and send her home, but she comes back again a couple months later with the same disease, and you're getting frustrated. And so you ask yourself, why can't I just cure her? Yeah, we have medicines that treat malaria, but is there a better way to approach the problem? Am I here strictly as a technician, as someone who treats the human body, or am I here as someone who looks at the grander health context of the situation? And that's the essence of the question of the determinants of health, is how best do we intervene to make people healthier? So let's ask us some questions. Here is Chad, by the way. Chad's a, a poor country, as I mentioned, that's landlocked within Africa, and it's bordered by Libya, Sudan, Niger, and some other countries. But we ask ourselves a few questions. First question we ask ourselves is, how did this little girl get malaria in the first place? If our goal here is not simply to treat her, but to prevent future infections of malaria, we have to ask ourselves how she got it. Well, we know that malaria is carried by mosquito bites, is caused by the plasmodium parasite, which is uh, borne by mosquitoes. So what if we were able to control the mosquito population? Would that solve our problem? But why are there so many mosquitoes? If we understood why the burden of mosquito uh, prevalence is so high, then maybe we could create some policies or practices to control that situation. Well, mosquitoes breed, we know, on standing water. So if we can avoid having too many pockets of standing water, then we could prevent uh, there being so many mosquitoes, especially around where this girl and her family live. But why are there so many pockets of standing water? If we all know this, why do they still exist? Well, that's complicated. It tends to have something to do with the rainfall patterns and the nature of the built environment. So if you live in a poor neighborhood with pockmarked roads or with uh, questionable engineering or crumbling infrastructure, there are going to be lots of opportunities for pockets of water to be maintained. And if there isn't any money to clear it out, well, we're going to have a lot of standing water, a lot of mosquito breeding, and therefore a lot of malaria. But why is that infrastructure so poor? If we know this is a problem, how come we can't fix it? Well, we're dealing with a poor country, and they have other issues going on. They're trying to solve their debt crisis, there are some insecurity issues, um, there are some civil society issues, there are employment issues. Maybe this is not currently a political priority. And why isn't it a political priority? Well, there are historical factors that prevent them from having sufficient money to deal with all of this. Why are they so poor? That's a complicated political science question having to do with colonialism, international trade, um, some issues around corruption. Suddenly, what started out as a medical question is now a political science and history question. So, if you are that doctor trying to treat that little girl in Chad, what skills do you need? Well, you have the obvious anatomy and physiology skills that have to do with being a physician, the biochemistry, and so forth. Now, suddenly, you have to know some engineering. Why is that building there so poorly designed that it has standing water in it? Suddenly you have to know some history. Why does the country in which I live in have poor malaria control? Or a little bit about the biology and entomology of mosquitoes. Uh, the reproductive habits. Uh, when are they most active? How to kill them? I need to be able to speak this little girl's language and to communicate with her and her parents. I need to understand the situation of her community. Why does she keep getting reinfected? Uh, if I give her some prophylaxis to use, how come she's not using them well enough? Or a bed net. Why is her family not using the bed net? That has to do with her own personal economic circumstances. Again, the situation became a lot more complicated than simply giving her medicine to make the symptoms of her malaria go away. Now ask ourselves this question. 
do rich people in Chad have the same malaria challenges as the poor people? The girl you just treated is poor. But the rich people, one could argue, tend to live in neighborhoods with fewer mosquitoes. Why is that? Well, because they can afford better engineering, better infrastructure, better city planning, neighborhoods with uh, uh, smoother streets, and people paid to maintain the environment. The wealthy people tend to live in homes that aren't infested with mosquitoes. Why? Because they've paid for better bed nets, uh, maintain the walls, have people in the house who are actively trying to kill insects. Their children tend to sleep under good mosquito nets. If you've ever been to tropical countries with mosquito problems, bed nets are common, but it's difficult to maintain them. They tend to rip, and so we tape them together, we sew them together. But all you need is a pretty good hole, and suddenly uh, you've failed to solve the problem. So rich families have better bed nets. Rich children tend to have better nutrition, and therefore less likely to get sick in general and they're more resilient against infection. If they do get infected, they're going to bounce back a little faster. Wealthy individuals tend to work indoors. They aren't going to be exposed to the insects and the challenges of the outdoor environment. They're not going to be bitten as much. If they are infected, they can afford faster and better care. So clearly there's a difference between the poor experience and the rich experience. Even though we all have the same biology, we're all, uh, in theory, equally at risk of infection. So, what is the cause of malaria? Is it the plasmodium parasite? Is it the mosquito bite? Or is it poverty? There's an argument to be made that poverty is the cause of malaria. It's not the proximal cause, it's not the only cause, it is a cause. And this becomes clear when you consider places that are currently wealthy that used to be malaria zones like Washington, D.C., or even downtown Ottawa, both of which have a history of large numbers of malaria deaths. In fact, in downtown Ottawa, you can find uh, monuments to all the mosquito deaths that took place, the malaria deaths, rather, that took place a couple of hundred years ago. And yet, malaria no longer exists in those wealthy cities. Clearly, something can be done, and that something has to do with development and wealth. So that's where the determinants of health idea uh, comes into play here. If we acknowledge that there are other factors that lead us to health states that aren't necessarily biomedical factors, then that gives us opportunities to intervene at levels beyond the biological. If we can invest in infrastructure, if we can invest in employment, if we can invest in overall wealth, if we can invest in better behaviors, then we don't have to invest in medicine or in physicians. We have new options for addressing health issues. So suddenly, things that weren't obviously health-related are now relevant to medicine. Commerce. If people are employed or are wealthy or engaged in the economy, they are less likely to be unhealthy. Government. How responsive is the government? How responsible are they? How well-funded and equipped are they to deal with public health crises? Finance. Do we have enough money to deal with these issues? Have we planned our cities well enough to be uh, responsive or to be less likely to fall prey to um, health crises? Are we producing food in a healthy way? Religion, what does religion have to do with health? Well, think about it. It's possible that the comfort that one draws from one religious experience allows one to be more mentally capable of uh, resisting the negative effects of poor health and so forth. We can make an argument that pretty much anything in the world, any experience, any human adventure or endeavor is to some extent related to health. So we have a variety of categories of these determinants of health, and for a moment let's divide them between social and physical determinants of health. The social ones include this extensive list, and this, by the way, is not exhaustive. We can think of all kinds of other types of social determinants of health. This is just a smattering. So are you exposed to crime? Do you live in a neighborhood that is known to have a lot of violent experiences? If that's the case, you're at risk for violence. You're at risk for poor health. Do you have social support networks? We'll talk more about that in this course. 
but do you have people in your life you can speak to that can help assuage your mental health issues? Are you poor? If you're poor, as we discussed, you're more likely to be unhealthy. Do your children go to good schools? If so, they're more likely to be exposed to healthy behaviors and more likely to end up uh, working in conditions that are more healthy. Do you have transportation options that are safe and reliable so that you don't have to take unhealthy pathways to get to work or school? And so forth. The physical determinants are a bit more obvious. For example, if you live in a place where the weather is problematic, where you're going to be trapped in a blizzard or drowned under torrential rainfall, that's bad for your health. If you live in a place where there's standing water and so the mosquitoes can breed and give you malaria, that's a problem. Or where your roof is about to collapse on you and kill you, that's a problem. Do you live in a place where toxic substances, such as asbestos in your walls, might make you sick? Well, that's a problem. Right? So there are all kinds of issues that we can target at a societal level to make people healthier that aren't in and of themselves medicine. Can you think of others? There are literally scores, if not hundreds, of other possibilities. Let's think about race for a second. Is race a determinant of health? Well, race is certainly associated with certain health outcomes. In the USA, if you're black or Hispanic, you're more likely to be of low income. You're more likely to live in neighborhoods with higher crime rates. You're more likely to live in neighborhoods with poorer nutrition options. So while it may not be true that, that the physicality of being black or Hispanic makes you more likely to get certain diseases, it is true that that personal experience is associated with other kinds of factors that may lead to poor health, like poverty, like poor nutrition, and so forth. So in that sense, yeah, race is a determinant of poor health. What about government type? Well, there's an argument to be made that democracies have healthier people than tyrannies. If you live under a dictatorship, you're less likely to, to achieve great wealth. You're less likely to have uh, a broader breadth of personal uh, products, maybe less likely to feel uh, a sense of achievement. Who knows? But there's an argument to be made that government type is also a determinant of health. What about the nature of your economy? Is your economy doing well? Do you live in a capitalist economy versus a Marxist economy? It's entirely possible that those are predictors of health as well. We can make an argument for pretty much anything. This diagram gives us a sense of how these determinants play together. So we have broad general socioeconomic, socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions. And we have these factors here that are, that are sort of um, everyday determinants that affect us, like unemployment, like do we have access to health services? Uh, how is the place where we work? Is it a healthy place? How well educated are we? Do we have access to good food? And then we have our social networks that transcend all these factors. Do we have friends in these places? Do we feel mentally healthy? That we have lifestyle factors. We can be wealthy and well-educated and live in good places, but if we're chronic smokers or chronic drinkers or we abuse recreational drugs, these are choices that will make our health less good. And beneath all that, we have these factors we can't really change. Right? We're born with certain predispositions to disease as well. But the things that we can affect as a society tend to be these larger determinants. And... It's arguable which is most important. That's going to vary depending on the individual circumstance. Let's go through another example for a second. So in Ontario, we have the Ontario Health Insurance Plan, OHIP, which is our Medicare plan. And sometimes we have citizens who want a certain medical procedure covered by OHIP that isn't covered. And so we have to go to court. And lawyers, lawyers will represent individual citizens who are seeking to have certain kinds of of conditions reimbursed, let's say chronic pain, for example. Here's a web of skills that such a lawyer needs to bring to bear. It's not just about understanding the law. This individual has to understand the anatomy and physiology of chronic pain in order to uh, argue on behalf of their client most vociferously. They have to understand 
the research around chronic pain, so understand how to look at academic research. You need to understand the law and history, obviously, and even the economics. So what is chronic pain costing the province? Therefore, uh, why should we fund it under the Medicare plan? And so forth. So here's an example that Health Canada has on their website. It's called really, Why is Jason in the hospital? Well, Jason's in the hospital because he has an infection in his leg. Why does he have that infection? Well, he, he had a cut on his leg and it got infected. But why did it get cut? Because he was playing in the junkyard next to his building and there was some sharp, jagged steel and he fell onto it. But why was he playing in a junkyard and, and not in a schoolyard? Well, because his neighborhood is poor, it's run down. And a lot of kids play in the junkyard because there's no one there to supervise them. But why does he live in that bad neighborhood? Because his parents are poor and can't afford to live in a better place. But why can't his parents live in a better place? Because his dad is unemployed and his mother is sick. But why is his dad unemployed? Well, his dad was uneducated and couldn't find a better job. But, but why? So as we see, the why questions get broader and deeper and further. But they're important. Because any one of these why questions, we can intervene with a policy or an intervention of some kind to prevent Jason from being in that hospital in the first place. And it very often has nothing to do with medicine or what we think about traditionally as the health sciences. In other words, health is not just about medicine, and that is why we study the determinants of health. Thank you very much.